Avui tenim a la ponent internacional la doctora Karen Donders, que ens parlarà dels models de finançament del servei públic audiovisual. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Dr. Karen Donders. She's a senior researcher and lecturer at Iman's Digital Technology Society, sorry, at the Center for Studies on Media, Information and Telecommunications, SMIT, at the Brige Universität Brussels in Belgium. She is also a postdoctoral research fellow at the Research Foundation Flanders and a guest lecturer at the Universität Antwerpen. Dr. Donders is an expert in media policy and she has an extensive number of academic publications in this field. Among them, she is the author of the book Public Service Media and Policy in Europe, published in 2011. This book provides an in-depth account of EU policies in the area of public service broadcasting, focusing mainly on the application of the European state aid rules. She's also an editor of different books, among them one uh, with Caroline Powells and Jan Loysen, which is forthcoming the next month, the Palgrave Handbook of European Media Policy. Today, Dr. Donders will address a keynote about reinventing public service broadcasting. This is a current key issue for all public service broadcasters in Europe, and we are very looking forward to hearing how we can reinvent the existing funding models. We do thank Dr. Donders for having accepted our invitation and for being here with us today in Barcelona. Thanks so much. And Dr. Donders, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you, Carmina, for uh, the introduction. Thank you also for inviting me. And same gratitude also to your president, Rosa Franket. It's really nice to be here in uh, Barcelona. Yesterday, the weather was also very, very nice. I understand you couldn't enjoy it because you were here inside. I wasn't because I do not understand Catalan. Um, I was interested in the program, though, but I cannot really complain since we enjoyed uh, the sun, um, which is not that present in Brussels nowadays. Um, but it's not only because of the weather I'm happy to be here, but obviously also to discuss um, some issues related to public service media. I have to say I'm not an expert in, 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 in Spain and in public service media in Spain, so I take more of a European perspective. But nevertheless, I hope that you will be able to relate some of the things I will be telling today to the specifics of uh, the Spanish uh, situation. Now, uh, Carmina asked me to talk about two things, eh? uh, reinventing public service broadcasting, PSB, and reinventing funding models, both question mark. Um, I will do something that is actually not acceptable in presentations. I will already answer the questions beforehand and then hope you stick with me for the following 20, 25 minutes. So reinventing PSB, I think the answer to that question is obviously yes. Eh? We will have to rethink the project for the 21st and hopefully 22nd uh, uh, century. Although I very often think that reinvention is too strong a word. I would rather talk about continu uh, continuity and change at the same time. And I'll explain later on what I exactly mean with that. Reinventing funding models, I would argue quite conservatively, no. <laughs> Uh, why? Because I, and I will come back to that later in the presentation, because while I do realize that public funding is under pressure in a lot of European countries, my argument, and I will elaborate on that later in the presentation, is that complementary sources like commercial communication, uh, even crowdfunding, will only be complementary revenue sources. You will never be able to really sustain a full-fledged public service media system on these kind of revenues. So the first part of my presentation is really focused on this transition from PSB to public service media. I'm sure that also Hurt Biermann um, has discussed quite a lot of different elements related to that transition yesterday morning. And then um, I will briefly touch upon uh, the funding question. So from PSB to PSM, I will really go quickly through that because I know that most of you will be quite familiar eh, with uh, the literature on uh, this topic is that in scholarly works, obviously, a lot has been written about public service broadcasting. Also, a lot has been written about public service media. And while we do see that key values like universality, quality, creativity, 
um, diversity are still at the center of what public broadcasts should be doing uh, for the next five to 25 years. There are obviously some differences eh, between public service broadcasting as a concept for policy and public service media. If there wouldn't be a difference, there would be no point in having a new concept at all. Um, I then always focus on the PSB, eh? so how does uh, this change? In terms of the public, we go from a mass audience conceptualization to um, still mass audience, because I do not agree with some scholars that say that the mass audience is completely, um, well, let's say, out of the picture. Eh? In Belgium, at the moment, for example, we have a huge entertainment show. 60, 65% of people are watching this show every single week. That's mass audience. At the same time, they do this. But complementary to that, obviously, as public broadcasters, you will have to target audiences. Eh? You will have to address niche audiences, personalize. And the nice thing about the new media environment is actually that it allows you eh, to cater for niche tastes much more eh, than basically the analog television environment. With regard to services, quite predictable. Not only television and radio programs anymore, but content services in the widest possible meaning. Uh, and that is something that is obviously difficult because a lot of public broadcasters and also other traditional media organizations are basically, their online strategy is very often just putting the radio and television broadcasts online. That's the online strategy. Will not work. Eh? It will have to be more uh, than that. Regarding the B, obviously it's no longer at the push broadcasting model. Again, it's still push broadcasting, but you will also have to add a pool model. And basically, the bottom line of my story is you will have to do more <laughs> as public broadcasters. And then the problem, but that comes later, as so first the nice My Little Pony Land, and then the reality uh, of the funding. Uh, you don't have a lot of funding, basically, uh, to, to do that big and great story but you will have to add something pool and co-creation and more participatory to the push model. Again, that is something at policy makers, public broadcasting strategy departments very often say, yes, we are doing more interactive and we're doing more participatory projects. In general, with some notable exceptions, it's a lot of ad hoc pilot projects, but it's not really structurally part of their DNA, which is normal because most broadcasting organizations, not only the public ones, rely heavily on television, and television is just one of the most formatted forms of content around. And it's all based on having control, whereas participation and co-creation is about letting loose of control to some extent. It's a very difficult one. Now, like I already said, this transition from PSB to PSM is well documented in academic literature. You will also find it in uh, documents of the EBU, of Council of Europe, um, and you will also find it in a lot of strategic documents of public broadcasters themselves. Now, what I always say is that's the talk, and then you have the walk. And at the moment, they are not colliding at all. Eh? So, we often assume that we're already in a public service media environment. I would say, like, with one leg we are, but the rest of the body still has to follow. And it's not easy because of funding, but also because organizations of public broadcasters are not always at, um, well, do not always have the required flexibility to adapt quickly to the new media environment. And obviously, there are all kinds of <laughs> historical and political reasons that explain for this. Um, I would also like to add that obviously, whereas in academia, with some exceptions, a lot of people are in favor of this transition to public service media. You all know eh, that this public service media idea is a lot under pressure eh, because of several different changes. Technological change, every single time when we had cable, when we had satellite, color television, teletext, every single time you have some technological progress, you have a lot of people that say, why do we need public service broadcasting? And obviously, last 10 years, we have a lot of technological change, so you have a lot of people saying, what's the point of having these public broadcasters? Economic change? the Facebook, Googles, YouTubes of this world. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was at a conference, and then somebody told me, oh God, what are you talking about these public broadcasters? YouTube is the biggest public broadcaster on the planet. I didn't agree, <laughs> because I, do, I see merit in YouTube, and I think they obviously eh, give a forum for people to upload content. It is not a public service initiative. Eh? We can discuss a lot about it, but it's guided by commercial profit-seeking motives. I have nothing against it, 
but to call YouTube the biggest public broadcaster on the planet, I thought, well, actually, it was a very popular statement. Eh? You can imagine in an audience of people that are not necessarily very much into public service media, if you say something like that, it's all hands clapping, and then you're like the naive scientist, like somewhere in the room, like, that is not really correct. Uh, political pressure. Um, I have to admit, <laughs> I'll say that now, uh, I have been on the side of politics myself, so I think I can safely say this. Um, politicians can be the best friend of public broadcasters one day, and the next day they can be their worst enemies. And at the moment I'm actually consulting and a public broadcaster in Flanders, and they still, after being around for 80 90 years, they're still, still surprised by this fact that politicians are like very volatile. Eh? They change their support whenever it suits them. It's a very difficult condition to work with. And I thought that public broadcasting people would be used to it. And they indeed do expect it, but every single time that politicians turn, they're still a little bit surprised. I think that's charming. <laughs> um, but it is a very difficult condition to work with. Um, now, related to that, um, I always have the impression how I get that because obviously governments in a lot of cases are the institutes that are funding public broadcasters, <laughs> that a lot of public broadcasters consider politicians as their main stakeholders, whereas actually the audience is the main stakeholder. And in general, audience support is much more stable, even if they are critical, it's much more stable than political support which is also not that difficult because politicians change overnight, eh? or can, um, in a lot of countries, eh? not, uh, probably not in all. Um, and I think there is really the crucial challenge for public broadcasters if they want to go into this public service media story, because consumers, it's not only technology that's changing, it's not only the economic environment that is changing, it's also the consumers that are changing. Not so much in terms of what they want, they still expect quality, they still expect creative content, they still expect it for free, or as free as possible. Uh, they still want public broadcasters to be reliable, but the way in which that a public broadcaster is delivering this to consumers, on that level, expectations do change, and certainly with younger audiences. And we see that at this moment, it is a big challenge for a lot of public broadcasters to reach younger audiences. In Belgium, average audience uh, age for public broadcasting, 52. In Germany, if I'm not mistaken, it's even 10 years higher. Hmm? It's, uh, and, and I hear these sounds from a lot of different countries, and this is really a challenge to come. So when everything is changing, public broadcasters should change also. They also say they change. With big institutions like those, and that is not something unique to media, change is very difficult, and it always goes much slower than scientists, eh? we are easy, we're on the side, eh? basically tell these institutions to change. Eh? After all, also universities are big institutions, they are really not that great at change either, eh? but that's uh, as a side remark. This might all seem like a very depressing story, like should we, eh? are then the criticism of public broadcasters right? Should we just get rid of public media, just throw them in the garbage bin? Well, I would obviously no, say no. Carmina asked me to talk for 30 minutes, so otherwise eh, the speech uh, would be over here. Um, but I also have a substantive reason why I do think that public service media will be necessary for the years to come. I've divided those reasons like in three clusters. Eh? Uh, first, and all these clusters present... Well, that is good to get attention. That's always, these things are made for men. Eh? I don't want to be, we had a conversation on a... <laughs> I don't want to get into this, but yesterday evening at dinner, we had a big discussion with some of you eh, about feminism and sexism in contemporary society. So my advice would be adapt these things to female presenters. They're not only male presenters nowadays. Um, so first, uh, <laughs> getting back uh, to the core uh, of the presentation. So first reason why I think that obviously public broadcasters today are still very valuable is, and this is nothing new, and markets around us are globalizing. 
So we get more and more global players. We also know that from figures which websites are the most popular uh, online. That's Facebook, 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 uh, certainly with younger audiences. It's all, all Facebook. Um, and, but we also know that players like Netflix are becoming more popular. And I think in this global environment, whether governments like it or not, public broadcasters are actually one of the most effective instruments that they still have to realize some sort of public service obligations and goals. Because they kind of lose control eh, of everything else that is outside this environment. Also, we know that audiences still want a lot of local content. Eh? Cultural proximity of content is very, very important for audiences. Um, but certainly, I know Spain is a bigger media market in Europe, but let's face it, 20 out of 27 media markets in Europe are small media markets, and those media markets, without a, a public broadcaster, would not be able to commercially sustain local content production. Simple reality. And even in Spain, I would argue, if I may, if you allow me, that without a public broadcaster, it would become very difficult eh, in terms of, because, well, Let's say Belgium is a much, much smaller media market, but obviously the GDP is higher, eh? so you have a little bit of a trade off there. Then secondly, and related, this international environment is increasingly, I would say, although this is more of a continuation with the past, controlled by international conglomerates. And very often, of these media conglomerates, we do not know exactly who is behind it. And a lot of different investment groups, so you get kind of a control of markets over this media sector. I actually read a couple of weeks ago that Liberty Global, it's an American multinational, is also active in the Spanish market and also wants to kind of broaden its activities in the Spanish market. Now in Belgium, we have a very tense relationship with Liberty Global. We don't like them. Uh, dominant American beep that they are. Um, <laughs> And what you see is actually when you look at just one example, so I know it's anecdotic to some extent, but when you see it, when you look at this group, big cable empire in the US established a very big uh, position in Australia. And now you see like if, if Liberty Global would be like a black spot on the European map, you see that spot like spreading all over. And these companies, although they very often also talk about local content, don't have an interest in local content. Eh? European markets are basically profit markets, export markets. That's it, in spite of rhetorics. Now, together with this increasing control of markets over the media sector, and a little bit paradoxically, perhaps, I would argue that in a lot of European markets, you also see an intensifying control of the state again over media, which is very often justified because of the economic crisis and instable environments, and do not only mean in southern and northern, uh, uh, southern and eastern Europe. I also see that in Western Europe, eh, that the whole idea of using a public broadcaster, for example, as a means to kind of promote government policies is on the rise again. So I would say that certainly within this context, you actually need a very strong public service system independent from market and government control as much as possible. Ideal, eh? not talking about practice yet. Uh, then thirdly, very often eh, you hear in this new media market that content is abundant. Eh? So there is so much content that why do we need a public broadcaster? Because all content is readily available in the market itself. Um, first, an increase in quantity is not an increase in quality. Very often, those two are treated as the same, obviously not the same. Second, we also know, uh, other colleagues of mine eh, have researched this extensively, that the idea that all different types of content are made available by the market, that that is simply not true. We know that investigative journalism is an issue, local children's content is an issue, eh, fiction for children. In the commercial children's market, it's all animation. That's basically it. We know historical documentaries, cultural documentaries, all these types of content, high quality drama, not that easy for the market to sustain that uh, for, let's say, most European countries, perhaps except for the UK and even there, uh, the statement can be made. So my argument on the basis uh, of these points would be that 
Whereas some eh, would actually say public service media is not necessary anymore, my argument would be that public service media has the potential to become even more important for society than public service broadcasting has ever been in the past. What then should public broadcasters do? This is obviously a very, well, it's my own eh, opinion, and you can obviously put different uh, emphasis. Um, I have clustered these around these tasks around seven Cs, just for retention purposes. Um, first, content is king. You have to continue investments in content. And I do not only mean radio and television programs, I also mean online content. Eh? A lot of public broadcasters are saying, yes, of course, we're public service media, and online is very important. And they spend like 3% of their revenues online. Walk the talk, eh? again. So investing in content, certainly when it comes to news, eh? since the, the print sector is so much under pressure, eh? you really have to step up as public broadcasters your game there. But also, for example, entertainment. I do think that high-quality local entertainment is a job for public broadcasters. Some people don't agree with me. I do, because you reach a lot of citizens in that way, and you can actually also fulfill certain cultural or educational tasks with uh, entertainment. But good entertainment, eh? Not like taking an international format, making a worse local version of it. That's not really eh, what I mean. Uh, creativity and innovation. Um, in some countries, it's clear uh, that public broadcasters do no longer have this image of being creative and inov innovative. The idea also with audiences is more that public broadcasters play on the safe side. And very obvious, uh, often that's obviously not to disturb politicians too much, but public broadcasters are funded to take risks. That's the whole idea, eh? because in commercial markets, simply risk taking is not that attractive. Eh? If with the voice you have like, I don't know, 30% market share, you will do the voice again. Even if you then only have 27% market share, that's still very much okay. So as a public broadcaster, I think you need absolutely to step up the game with regard to creativity and innovation. Conservation. Yeah, I'll always switch that picture eh, with something local. No, uh, honestly, when, when we talk about buildings and paintings, people almost automatically agree at the level of rhetoric, so I'm not saying at the level of funding, but automatically agree that is cultural heritage. We should protect it. Obviously, I don't agree with it. I do not want to smash this building down. I wouldn't dare. But then when we're talking about television or radio, of which the cultural impact on all layers of society, admittedly, is bigger than a painting that like 1% of the population has ever seen, then suddenly that argument wouldn't fly anymore. I find that very strange. I really am convinced that public broadcasters, and some are doing this, others aren't, should digitize, and again, that has a financial implication, should digitize all the content, make it available online, um, and not only make it available to watch or to listen again, but also make it available to play around with. <coughs> Reuse it, recreate, basically. Conversation. Very difficult for public broadcasters and for all traditional media organizations. In this new media environment, you actually have a lot of opportunities to fill the public service remit better. You can engage not anymore only in a one-way traffic, but in a two-way traffic with the audience. I still think, well, we have forums, we have chat, you know, you're not being independent. This is not how you should work. I think they should do this and not try to pretend in some way or another. I have been in these conferences where I saw people from public broadcasters that you know have clear issues with regard to independence, claim they are independent and nobody talking back, nobody saying that's simply not true. I have some issues with that. Also because, and that is uh, one of the other C's that I think is important, credibility. I already said earlier that public broadcasters should be concerned about securing audiences. Eh? Not in terms of reach, but in terms of audiences supporting a system of public service media. Audiences can be critical. Eh? I think it's very good that audiences are critical of their public broadcaster, but in the end they should love it, trust it, and find it reliable. 
Uh, in Belgium, every single time the public broadcaster is doing something wrong, not only politicians, but also citizens are blogging about this in our forums. But in the end, surveys point out that uh, over 90% of uh, Dutch-speaking people in Belgium are absolutely in favor of a strong public broadcasting system. They are critical, but they love it and they trust it at the same time. If you're not politically independent, gaining that trust and the status of credibility is virtually impossible. And then finally, a C on collaboration. That has not so much to do with what public broadcasters should do themselves, but what they can do with others to increase their impact on society with other public institutions, libraries, museums, certainly when it's about online projects, there are a lot of opportunities there. And I would even argue with commercial media companies, preferably local ones, to strengthen the local media ecosystem. So this is a whole lot of things public broadcasters should do. And what then about adequate funding? I actually first had a lot of numbers in this presentation of how much funding public broadcasters were getting in European countries and how it evolved. And I just deleted all of them because the overall point is that it's not going that well. Um, now, what is adequate funding? Um, adequate funding, and I will use the definition of the European Commission to point out that it's not really clear. Uh, according to the European Commission, adequate funding... Uh, so, funding cannot exceed what is necessary to compensate for the cost of public service obligations. This is commonly referred to as the net cost principle or the proportionality principle. As a government, you cannot give more than what public broadcasters actually need to do their job. Uh, you will know, or perhaps you don't, that the European Commission has investigated a lot of funding schemes in a lot of different member states of the EU, including the Spanish uh, funding schemes. In one of these investigations, the European Commission said that there was no adequate funding, that there was undercompensation, and that was in the Portuguese state aid <coughs> investigation. Now you say, oh, that's great, and then something happened. No, of course it didn't, because the European Commission can only act when there is overcompensation. So when you give more than what is necessary. When you give less than what is necessary, I can say it's less, but that is basically it. I think that's regrettable, you know. It would have been nice if they could say, you know, it's not enough, you should give something more. No, it's only when you give a little bit too much that they can ask you to, uh, to reimburse that money. Now, this is all very theoretical, eh, because what does that mean in practice? That if you have a good accountancy department at your public broadcaster, you can always make sure that the sum of what you spend and what you get is like zero, eh? and that is basically the principle. Um, now, I would say, qualitatively speaking, that funding is obviously no longer adequate where you can no longer do what you should do. Um, and in that regard, I think one should also note that most public broadcasters have more tasks nowadays than they had like five or ten years ago, but still the funding has remained at the same level or has decreased. It's a very difficult exercise. Uh, so most public broadcasters in Europe, except for the British, the French the German, I would say, are not adequately funded. On the other hand, obviously, I know a lot of public broadcasting organizations always say, we have to cut costs, and it's not fair, and they're always against us. And I do get that, but at the same time, you always have these scandals popping up. That's not in Spain, but in most other countries um, I've been working on and doing research on and I visited, you have these scandals about poor management, politicized employment policies, about waste of money in some way or another. So obviously it goes hand in hand. Eh? If you want stable and adequate funding, you also have to prove that you can be accountable in terms of what you then later on do with that money. In Europe, and, and that's where I decided eh, to delete all the tables that I had, uh, you have an enormous diver diversity in terms of funding system. Eh? You have license fee based systems, government grant systems. Uh, you have systems that rely nearly exclusively on public funding, whereas other systems also have to draw from commercial uh, revenue. Stability of funding. In some countries, it's really not such a bad story. It's like stable or it's going up a little bit. In other countries, it's like boom. Like in the Netherlands, for example, eh, where Ruth is from. It's not looking that bright. Eh? Um, which is also then a little bit scary because Belgium, as you know, is a neighbor of the Netherlands. And then suddenly Belgian politicians are, hey, in the Netherlands, you're saving 100 million. Perhaps we should do the same. And so they kind of infect each other with these IDs. Um, 
capacity also to adapt to budget cuts. Some organizations can deal better with cost-saving exercises than others. And some organizations, they just say, okay, in every department we have to save 50 million, so in every department we just fire 50 people or 100 people. Whereas in other departments, uh, they tend to try to be a little bit more flexible on how to cope with these things and not to adopt these kind of linear recipes that always result in failure, uh, basically. Uh, and in a lot of countries, instrumentalization of the economic crisis. That is something, for example, in Belgium, I do not know here in Spain, we often hear, yes, but all organizations have to save costs. It's an economic crisis, why are you complaining? But when we look at the figures, we see that public broadcasters had to save more money, relatively speaking, I'm not talking about absolute terms, but relatively speaking, and also cultural institutions had to save more than all other public institutions. So that is instrumentalization of the economic crisis, because why then do public broadcasters have imbalance to save more than other public institutions? It's not about that you do not want to save money, I think most public broadcasters would, to some extent, be willing to discuss. Hmm? It's obviously about whether or not you're being punished more than the rest of the system. So overall, we see a de facto decrease of public funding for public broadcasters in Europe when you take into account inflation. If you do not take into account inflation, it's going up a little bit, but obviously and that's not the figure that is representing the real situation. So when you look at the situation of an overall decrease in funding, and very often people tell me public broadcasters should look for new funding models. At the moment, that's also very hot in Belgium. We have to look for new funding models. Now, essentially, in media, you have three funding models. And obviously, you can diversify a little bit, but it comes down to the state is paying, advertisers are paying, or the consumer is paying. And then you have some submodels, but essentially, uh, that's basically what you have. Public broadcasters uh, mainly rely on subsidies and li or license fee. And what you see in a lot of countries is where public broadcasters also relied or rely on commercial communication, that there is a lot of pressure to... <laughs> I, will, I will just hold this now. Eh? Um, that there is a lot of pressure to withdraw from this commercial communication market. Eh? I mean, Spain is the perfect example, France, but also in a lot of other countries you have this pressure. So in terms of diversifying into commercial communication, very limited possibilities. The trend is actually the other way around, less commercial communication. Free-to-air commercial broadcasters are doing very, have very difficult times eh, with ad skipping and all these problems. The print sector is doing very, very bad. So no chance that governments will actually, for the coming five years, approve public broadcasters elaborating their commercial communication activities. I don't see that happen. Then you could also argue, can we then as public broadcasters get more out of pay services? Very difficult one also, because that goes against the whole idea of universality. Hmm? Against people paying for public services that should be widely available. The only circumstance in which I would say that pay services are acceptable is when you, for example, offer bundles of services together with commercial operators, so then you have to, eh? because otherwise you would be market distortive. But again, that's not like the big, we can get 60% of our revenues out of this eh? story. So I do not see a lot of diversification models. Now, when I was talking a little bit about this yesterday evening, Roberto, because he's a very clever guy, said to me, what about crowdfunding then? Um, yeah. It was already in there before. I was very happy it was already on there. But he said, what about crowdfunding? And it's something I very often hear since I'm working uh, a lot on, let's say, media policy and, and the interplay with media economics and business models. And these days, a lot of politicians also ask me, and that I still know from a couple of years ago, yes, but we should go to crowdfunding. Eh? It's such a hot and hip word. It's really trendy. <laughs> uh, I don't believe in it either. Why? You will, you will find me the most depressing person you've ever had to listen to, perhaps. But um, our European markets are simply too small to sustain big projects like pu public service media on the basis of crowdfunding. And certainly then in the countries that are economically not doing well, I've 
there are some successful uh, examples of crowdfunding in the Netherlands and Belgium, but that is really for small journalistic projects. Eh? They raise like two million, three million tops, and then they hire 10 journalists, and obviously that's very valuable, but we all know that that isn't sufficient to sustain public service media. Hmm? Also, my issue that I have with crowdfunding, because and also obviously a lot of people always refer to the American situation where PBS is almost, eh, well, it's not really crowdfunding, but it's still as being funded by citizens, eh, um, as a charity project. And I, oh, I detest the idea. I always think, you know, in Europe, in European countries, we have the constitution, we have the parliament, and we have a public broadcaster. It's like at the basis, well, in most European countries, we have seen in Greece that that can go down the slide very quickly. But that at least, in my opinion, I would not like to see public service media, which is now actually the basis, at least theoretically, of the system. Um, I would not like to see it become a charity. You know, it's something, or you believe it's necessary for society, or you don't believe it. Eh? That's, and then obviously you have all the scientific evidence that comes with it, but essentially being in favor or against public service media is a normative choice, eh? something scientists do not like, but it is in general. So no, I also do not really believe in crowdfunding. So conclusion, was this simply a depressing story uh, about uh, the decline and fall of public service broadcasting? Eh? To quote the title of a famous book published on this topic in 1998, if I'm not mistaken. Um, no, I would not say so. I still think that public service media has the potential to become this important for society if it's stepping up its game, if it's, for example, also taking up these 10 recommendations of the European Broadcasting Union, which are incredibly valuable, are also less theoretical than my expose, so really contain hands-on uh, recommendations. But if you want to continue, the crucial issue is to secure public support. Because if the public is really very much in favor of public service broadcasting or media, it will become more difficult, not impossible, but more difficult for politicians to turn their back on public service media. I'm convinced of this. When in Greece the public broadcast was abolished, we had a lot of discussions about this in Belgium. And I even had this shop where I buy my newspaper every day. The, the, the owner of the shop has a, has a son of eight, eh, and the children's content of the public broadcaster in Belgium is really very popular. And uh, the owner of the shop said, you should ask her, she's a professor in media. Eh? And he was like, yeah, would that mean that they could actually abolish GetNet, GetNet, which is the children's channel eh, in, in Belgium of the public broadcaster? And this little boy of eight couldn't imagine that you would actually take it away, and not in a commercial way. He was eight, and he had this public service kind of sense over him. I think that was wonderful, and that is something, securing public trust, whether it's on radio or television or online, is really what you uh, should do, experimenting with funding schemes. I think you can do it on the side, but be very careful with it. Public funding, whether we like it or not, and whether or not it's under pressure is the way that we actually have to go, I think. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. It was 30 minutes exactly, so thanks. Um, I will open um, the floor for questions. Pudeu fer preguntes en català o en castellà, jo les puc traduir. Um, I'll, I'll break the ice. So, ah, Lucia. <laughs> um, ja, ja, does one wait because she's bringing the microphone? If the public broadcasting system is so important in Europe and is like the basis in the continent, why are our politicians in Euro, in Brussels, the European Commission, or are not uh, playing harder in their support? Um, well, that's an interesting question, actually, and, and 
I would agree that certainly when you, uh, you had the whole Greek drama, that certainly the European Commission should have responded more actively and really should have said, you know, this is unacceptable. Now, uh, they took a little bit, let's say, uh, the, middle, the, the middle way. Um, I think the reason why certainly the European Commission, because the Parliament in general has been quite favorable of public service, broadcasting and media, I think the European Commission is kind of um, limited in its competencies to say something about public service media as a big policy project. It can intervene on competition law, on the basis of competition law. Why? Because it has extensive powers to do so. Regrettably, that's not always eh, the ground that we want them to intervene on eh, because it's more about limiting than it is about enabling. When it comes to cultural competencies, the member states have simply limited very much the powers of the European Commission and said, this is our business, stay out of it. Eh, every single time, not only with regard to public service media, but also when it comes to pluralism and diversity, member states have said, this is our business. Eh? So if we would like to have European institutions that can defend this institution more powerfully, then we will basically have to give these competences to the European uh, institutions, the Commission in general. And because I do know that certainly within uh, the DGs that are responsible for culture and education, that there is certainly a heart for public service media, but there is always this kind of, no, we cannot do this because this is a member state area. And actually that is something that the member states have created themselves. So to some extent we have the European institutions that we have created ourselves. Um, I actually would like to see eh, more cultural competences for the European Commission. I know for some people it is a nightmare, but I think it will really give them more basis to, to, to act against um, some undesirable practices in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of countries. What I see in a lot of countries is that politicians are actually blaming public broadcasters for things they have created themselves. <laughs> like you have so much stuff and then I think, you know, I don't know how this is in Spain, but like in Belgium until like 20 or 30 years ago, if you hired someone in a public broadcaster, that person had to have like a party affiliation. And if it was someone of the socialist party, then, you know, Christian Democrats and liberals wanted someone in also, so you got an exponential increase of the uh, employment figures. And then like 10 years ago, politicians were saying like, it's incredible how many staff you have. It's really, it's bad management. And I was like, hey, you did this yourself, you know, but politicians forget very quickly what they kind of <laughs> did wrong. It, it's very convenient, eh? the selective memory. Um, but um, I think these are the two things. If we want Europe to have more and uh, to say more, we have to give them the power to do so. And also, uh, I think we should be more critical of our politicians when they sometimes make so, much, so blunt statements on public service media that do not correspond in any way with the historical reality of the system. I think, well, I still hope for journalists and that say it's not correct what you're saying, but obviously it's very difficult because they have to criticize the hand that is feeding them. Eh? So it's a... Uh, it's a difficult situation. In, in this sense, I would like to add that also what happens in Brussels is that it's like the jungle. It's not an innocent place where things happen in a peacefully and harmonic way. And you have so many lobbying people President, the politicians and commercial broadcasters are investing amounts of money that you cannot imagine in pressing them. And for example, from EBU, we have an office there. We have six people full time there working. We work together with the national broadcasters. At the same time, it's very difficult to get all the broadcasters to agree on what they want from Brussels. Mm -hmm. We have enormous problems whenever we want to do something because we are as Karen said, a members-driven organization, and we want to support some position, and oh, this is not good for us, and this is good for the others, and it's, it's very difficult. So I would say, uh, being self, having some self-criticism, and EBU needs to do better, and, and also the public broadcasters need to be a bit smarter in how they approach uh, European institutions, because it's, it's about money. Carmina, if I can come in on this, eh? I absolutely obviously uh, agree with what you say, Roberto. I also think that when I see that in a lot of countries there is still fierce lobbying from commercial broadcasters eh, against public broadcasters, I always think, you know, 
this is a battle that is essentially over or should be over. Eh? Um, kind of a discourse that we try to convince companies um, of in, in Belgium was that, you know, you're focusing on the public broadcaster, but actually, you know, we have international companies we have to fight against. And they are laughing because we are arguing amongst each other. And what we try to do is find, let's say, joint projects that we can collaborate on eh, with commercial broadcasters, you know of them. Um, we are now trying, eh, I'm advising the public broadcast on also to try to find some collaborative projects with the print sector, eh, because the print sector is going against public service media even more aggressively at this point than commercial broadcasters. And I think the challenge is with local players that you find collaborative projects, even though that is difficult and even though you're competitors, because you're actually fighting. I mean, I think it's, it's deplorable that so many resources are going into lobbying in Brussels against other local players. What's the point of that? We should, lo we should lobby if we lobby for something, if we invest resources in something, then it should be in, in securing uh, a European diverse locally and uh, established media market. Well, as at least I'm very much convinced of this. I very often find it also disgraceful if I sometimes walk around in Brussels in this jungle and see commercial and public broadcasters going at each other like cats and dogs. Then I think, you know, that was a fight of the 80s and 90s. Get over it. Well. Finish right now. Thank you so much because we are a little bit behind schedule. So thank you, Karen. It was really interesting. And we are moving to the next.